This is Sarah Seberg. Welcome to Kingdom Real. Today, we have a really exciting guest. I am so thankful that she's here. Her name is Heidi Waldheis. Thank you so much for coming. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Can't wait to do this. I've been looking forward to this. As have I. I've been like, is it time? <laughs> no. Nope. Is it time? <laughs> nope. It's time now. So I love yes. it. I've heard part of your story, and it's yes. absolutely amazing. And I just want to thank you so much for coming here mm -hmm. and being willing to just be open and honest and mm -hmm. just tell us your story. I am thankful for the opportunity and grateful to do this with you. I am, I'm, I'm truly honored and I'm very thankful to be here. So awesome. thank you for having me. All right, so we'll get started. Um, so just tell us what, tell us a little bit about growing up. Like what did you learn from, you know, your mm -hmm. family growing up? Sure. So growing up, um, I was born into and has always been in a family deeply involved and rooted in a very small ultra conservative uh, church denomination um, church twice a Sunday we've got catechism we've got Sunday school we did the go to grandma's house on Sunday because you always have the Sunday dinner after church and you know I grew up with those gatherings a lot of times it'd be go to one grandma for your little coffee and your sweet good and then you go for the main main event have your roast beef mashed potatoes and green beans at the other one because that's a good meal I guess for that <laughs> for the church crowd and um it, you know it was all I knew everybody I knew was in that church it was my entire world I think for the longest time I really didn't know that there was anything other out there I never thought of myself as different I didn't think that people lived differently or thought differently because you're immersed in it and when you're like itty bitty all the way to growing up and you hear that same thing you come to believe those things so I think though that unfortunately it my takeaways from what I really learned was that love is very conditional mm -hmm. and because that was what I learned through that I learned how to become an incredible actress because I crave love I wanted somebody to and after a while, I'm like, I'll just take life. You, will you like me? I'll be right. whatever you want. I'll act however you want. I'll look however I want. I'll grow my hair. I'll cut my hair. I'll curl it. I'll do it straight. I'll wear this. I'll act this. I'll be in choir. I'll play the piano. I'll do this. But will you like me? And it was that constant drive that no matter what I did, not quite good enough, keep trying, maybe. And it's kind of horrible when you're always waiting for the one thing you want so much to be taken away. Like, ah, how do I keep that? What's the magic secret? And um, at the time I didn't realize that's what I was becoming. It just was because I didn't know any different and surrounded by people all doing the same thing. It didn't stand out, so nobody draws attention to it. It kind of becomes the expected you have to look this way you're always happy you're always pleasant what can I do for you I'd be glad to make ham buns and potato salad for the funeral slash baby shower slash whatever it may be and um always happy always happy life is really good all the time and it wasn't it just wasn't and uh so it uh it became difficult the older I got. I would always been a questioner. I not in a defiant way. I literally just wanted to know. I, I thrive on information. Just teach me. Teach me why I believe this. Yeah. You've told me I believe it and I'm spouting it and I'm saying the right things. But can I know why? So it's a personal thing and I don't know that maybe it was a fear if people started having their personal thing it wouldn't be that church. So it was pretty much squashed. So that was my upbringing and I'll say it's poor preparation for the adult world. So that's where I came from and uh, my beginnings in life that have led me on quite the adventurous journey. Yeah, there's no, there's no amusement park that holds a candle to my roller coaster I've been on, so. So yes. 
tell me, you know, kind of in um, amongst all of that. Right. Tell me some like really good memories. I mean, do you mm-hmm. have brothers and sisters? Tell me I do. like some some memories of from when were you when you were little? Yes. Anything like that? Um, you know, it's funny sometimes. I'll try to think about and bring up memories, and it's almost like, do I have a lot of memories? Do I literally not remember anything? For a while, I thought, oh my goodness, I might have Alzheimer's or something because mm. I don't remember. But I think the mind is a protective thing, and um. I'll get, I'll get moments and spots where I'll remember different things, and um, it's like I, I'm the oldest of four siblings, and it was myself, and then I had two brothers, and then I had a much long-awaited sister, and oh my goodness, I can remember the joy I felt at having this new little sister. She came with me everywhere. I mean, I'm 16 years old, and I'm the one that's got my two-year-old sister in the back seat because I wanted to take her with me and hang out with her and spend time with her. And um, I think that worked out great because um, my mother didn't enjoy children. So for yes, her... she had four children. You grow up, you get married, preferably, you know, right after graduation, and it will be somebody from this church or somebody that you met on a young people's gathering that, you know, you find your mate. That's the reason for it. And you marry within the church, or if they're not from in the church, they must become a member of the church. Oh, okay. Yes, it, yes, you do not. So small circles. Um, think circles. tiny, okay. you know, tiny, tight, very close with lots of gatekeepers. That was, mm-hmm. that was the life. And, um, and I think for me, I was, I now can say that I was blessed with a personality that just loves to pour into people. I like to see people happy. I want to make them happy. I, I love all that stuff. I also wanted to be home with my children. It was the perfect storm in the making for me to be in this denomination because A, I loved being that stay at home mom and that was required so that part's easy. But it didn't mean there wasn't all the other turmoil around with it. And because I wanted so much just for everybody to be happy, I was easily controlled by that desire to not cause waves, to not hurt anybody, don't make anybody mad, don't disappoint them. So I sacrificed myself all the time. Mm -hmm. It was always at my expense, always, always, always. And um, over time, that becomes almost a self-loathing because there wasn't anybody that did that for me. Right. So something is very wrong with me very 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 wrong so then it's well how do I fix it well then try to be better try to be nicer try to be even more no waves make everybody happy at all costs and it's impossible and it's not what we're supposed to do Mm -hmm. it's never been what Jesus expected from us but I was trying desperately and um, that worked until it didn't and life kind of took some unexpected turns that you know, we don't plan for, nor was I prepared for, yet I didn't have a choice to jump in the deep end, and it's sink or swim at that point, mm-hmm. and I had children, so I knew I, I had to swim, and it wasn't pretty for a while, but, um, so they, I know that there were moments of happiness, and um, I find it sad that they didn't revolve around my parents. It didn't revolve around family because it really, I don't remember the warm family thing. There wasn't love and stuff expressed. I didn't have a mom who hugged me. I didn't have parents that fed me just saying, you're such a blessing to start crying now. Um, Children need affirmation and they want to know that they're worthy, that they matter, that they're loved. And when they don't, they grow up into adults that are willing to accept anything as long as somebody put the label that this is love on it. Or we would choose to say, well, this is as good as it's going to get for me. Um, So my moments came with, like, my dearest friend lived across the street from me. They were Catholic. Um, They went to a different denomination, but because there wasn't anybody from mine in there, 
I guess my parents bent the rules so I wouldn't be stuck in the house and they'd have to deal with me. So I was allowed to play with her and um, their home became like a haven for me. I loved being there. Almost like an escape. It, it was because of the dynamics of their family. And I got to watch a family that lived very differently, that loved each other differently, the dynamics between them all. It was just loving affirmation. And I was talking with my husband about this a few days ago. And all of a sudden it struck me something I hadn't thought about. My friend's father was a teacher at the local school public school. Um, He was a science teacher and I am fascinated by science, biology, and all of those things. And he used to sit and have conversations with me about things like that, like in-depth, intelligent conversation. He was interested in what I thought. He would teach me and show me and I was like, this is absolutely amazing. (laughs) There's a grown-up that's like willing to sit and talk with me about all these things and Um, It was just, it fed a craving need that I had for conversation that meant something, meaningful, real conversation. Um, And then they moved. (laughs) And it wasn't anymore. And that was more devastating now, you know, looking back, because then there was nobody. Um, How old were you? I was... I think I was 12 or 13 years old when she moved. Oh, such a fragile age. The worst time. Yes. The worst time. Mm -hmm. So it was then uh, pleading, well, do I have to go to school way over there? Because can I just go to the local school? Absolutely not. Do you have a specific school that you have to go to? Absolutely. There are schools run um, through that denomination, elementary, and junior high and a high school and it, it was required for members that their children must go their homeschooling is not an option public school is absolutely not an option um, must go to this school so for a lot of families that meant if mom's not bringing in an income fathers were often working two not unheard of three jobs trying to cover tuition did the church help with that at all um they would but if you had to go to them for financial help, they dictated how money was spent in your home. Oh, wow. So um, I, question, I, I think that's when I really started to question things because it didn't make sense to me. How can you have this strong family unit when one parent is never there? Right. It all falls on one parent. So I saw mothers just exasperated and frazzled because there's these huge families because that's expected. So she's like, it's all on her, everything. The child care, the running around, the house cleaning, the grocery shopping, everything. And he's exhausted when he gets home because, yeah, he's been working six days, never seven because, Don't you know, Sunday, Sunday mm-hmm. is dedicated morning till night, morning service, evening service. And it wasn't a one or the other. It was you must go to both of them. And... um And I just, that just started questioning in me. It didn't feel right. And because I am an avid reader, because I, I took to heart what people said. And then I would try to find that in this Bible that I had. And it seemed so different in Mm -hmm. the Bible than how it was lived out. And I started thinking, I think we kind of look like Pharisees. And that didn't sit right with me because I kind of knew what Jesus thought of them. And I'm like, I don't want to be one of them. Right. So then I'm in a conundrum. What do you do? Mm-hmm. What do you do? So I became that kid, that family visitation time. Sit down and be quiet. If they ask you if, you, if there's questions that any of you have, you don't. And I'm like, okay. It's like, don't embarrass us. And I was like, oh. So it's like every time I got shut down all the time. And... The teenage years are horrible. And um, so I never, when I say I didn't talk at home, I would talk, but I never said anything. It was just talking the talk. There was nothing about me, nothing personal, nothing. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask any questions. I didn't, none of me was there. But I got to where friends that I started making at the job that I had after school 
who didn't go to the school I went to, who mm. didn't go to the school I went to. I started really, really, really doing everything I could to spend more time with them. And it wasn't always doing good things, but I didn't care. Right. I didn't care. It was an out. It was a break because I knew I was going to crack. I was going to break. Mm -hmm. um, and it just eventually got to where it's like, God, I know that, you know, at the time we were raising anybody that commits suicide is going to hell. Now I think that was something they told us because they knew people would be like, I'm willing to take that to get out of here because I wow. used to beg God, yeah. please let me die. Please let this train hit me. Let my car die right here and let it hit me. Let that semi swerve let it, and let me die because then it's acceptable and that's okay. And then I don't have to be here anymore. And I would just plead, why do I have to be here? I don't want to be here. But I didn't want my siblings to be left because you were the Either. oldest. I was the oldest, and I loved them. <laughs> I loved them. And um, so, you know, there's just, I'm thankful that I didn't pursue it, that my healthy fear of hell was so strong that I didn't end my life at that point because I would have otherwise. Without a doubt, I know that I would have. And um, so then, you know, life goes on. I did the proper thing. Mary right out of high school and have kids and um so I had four kids my oldest was maybe six or seven and my world started completely coming undone and stuck in a world where there is no help for a woman in a relationship that is violently abusive and Our church, divorce is not an option, and when they say that, they mean that in every every situation, no matter what. Um, I sit and think back to it, and it's like the person I am now would never live that way. I just, it seems like some other person that I wish I could have. Can I go back and save her from that? Right. <laughs> so um, people say so much, you know, a spouse can't rape you. Yes, they can. Um, mine did regularly, brutally, sick, um, twisted, took photos of it that he liked to show people. Um, the psychological abuse, the physical abuse, um, um, I started noticing as my oldest was getting older, he started going after that particular child. And I'm like, this can't happen. I, it's like not my children, not my children. I will not let you hurt. I'll take it. I will take it, don't touch your kids. but don't touch my kids. Mm -hmm. So um, I did what every good wife does in this church, and you go to your consistory and you ask them for help. And um, I was told that my job as a wife was to be the example and hopefully God would use me to maybe someday turn his heart and that I was to subject myself to his desires. I was never to say no. Um, and, and this is what your church told you? This is what my church told me. My church went so far as to say, we will build an apartment in the basement of your home until you get over your stubborn silly notion that this is what you need so he will live in that apartment so it won't look to anybody like there is a separation and you can have your separate space and I'm like this man is going to kill me right he will I had letters written to two neighbors I said I need you to give these to somebody when he kills me and um The more I saw, though, going after my kids, I'm like, I, it's my job to protect my children. Mm -hmm. And they can't be here, and I will not allow this to happen to them. And I can't allow him to kill me and be the only parent to those children. So I made the decision to see an attorney, and I filed for divorce. Mm -hmm. I knew full well what that would mean for me in my situation. My family's the pillar of this church. They 
pretty much started the church. They dictate the terms of the church. They have written the everything that the church is based on, what they believe, what they teach, and how they instruct the young men going, being trained to become pastors. Most of it was written by my family. So there was great expectations, and they had great pride that nobody in our family has ever divorced. Nobody in our family has ever, and then there's me. I'm the oldest grandchild on that side of the family, and, um, and I did it. I made that move, and the knot came, and the elders were at my house, and I was informed at that point. I was given the opportunity to um, repent from my wickedness, to soften my unrepentant heart, to be willing to be the wife and the mother that God expects me to be. And I said, I can't live in this house with him, and I'm not, I can't stop this. I can't, I've been asking you to help me. And, um, and they said that they've left me with um, I left them with no option. That's what they said. And um, I was excommunicated and shunned from my church. But what that meant is I lost my entire family. I lost my parents. I lost my siblings. I lost my grandparents. I lost all my aunts. I lost all my uncles. I lost all my cousins. And I lost my friends. The whole world that you had known. Everything. My children were told at school that they could never come back to the school that they went to again. So they came home wanting to know why they couldn't go back to school with their friends. Nothing was in my name. The house wasn't in my name. I didn't own a car. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a bank account that had my name on it. So I literally, I was homeless with four kids, the oldest of which was about seven or eight, and no support. No money, no house, no car, no job, no church, nothing. And I was taught in our church that people that are excommunicated and shunned, what that means is they hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven itself. And when they have selected that for somebody, you are eternally cast out of heaven and you will go to hell. So their parting words to me were, it's with great sorrow that we excommunicate you and shut the doors of the kingdom of heaven to you and you are now on the road to hell and you're joyfully taking your children with you. Wow. And what do you do when you're taken out of the only world you know and you're set into a world that you haven't been prepared for? Nobody instructed me how to be a working mom. I didn't know about daycare. I didn't know that it was okay to apply for state benefits. So I never had a bridge card. I never applied for state aid. I never did any of it because I was instructed that that was wicked and sinful and you don't do that. So um, it was up to me to find a way and figure it out. And in hindsight, the only way that ever happened was God himself saying, I got this girl. I've got her. And um, I can see now, you know, looking back and thinking about that, you know, the one thing, hands down, the worst experience of my entire life. And even though it continues, I still pay the price. I'll pay it till I die. I'm never, it is what it is. I'm an orphan with a family all alive, present, and living near me. But I'm an orphan for all intents and purposes. But saying that, I look back and it's like the story of redemption and grace and love that <clears throat> what God has worked in my life in those decades between then and now is nothing short of miraculous. And I have been restored and filled and redeemed in a way that I could never have seen possible. And um, he's working things through me, because it's not me, <laughs> that um, that's allowing me to pour love into people just like me. 
people that I was back then, but now I get them as soon as it happens to them. And I'm, I'm not going to let them go through this. They don't have to. And we've now got a huge network. We're, we're there, and we're making a difference for them. And for me, it's my full circle moment. And the joy I have in that to go from this horrible, horrible ugliness in this period of time where I'm like, I can't do this. I don't know how I'm going to do this to go from there and to be here now in spite of things not being perfect nothing is wonderful things are broken but life is beautiful and it's amazing and the best is yet to come and I'm so excited for it and I'm thankful now for a God that loved me so fiercely through this that saw that the only way to get me to here was to make sure I was cleanly broken away from a denomination that never would have allowed me to be where I am now. And God needs me now to do what I'm doing right now. Right. Can I go back and ask, when you were going through all of this, did your family know what was going on in your marriage? Yes. And in the abuse and everything. And they as well did not yeah. yes. help you. Um, my father's words literally were, well, I did go out and beat him up, so I don't know why you think I didn't handle it. Do you not realize that just made him more angry and violent? Do you not realize that? Um, Even with their grandchildren involved? Yes, my, um, my parents hired an attorney and tried to take my children from me. When you decided to leave? When they, they heard that I filed the in the for divorce, they hired an attorney and attempted to take my children away from me. Your own parents. Too. My parents. I'm really excited to hear the rest of your story. Yeah. Because there's a lot there. <laughs> it it is absolutely incredible to hear, like you said, that full circleness that has come through all of this. And the thoughts that I was having while you were speaking were when nobody else saw you. In those moments, God did. God did. God saw you. He was never not there. He I was there. I never, ever felt that God wasn't my foundation. Mm -hmm. I've never, ever felt absent from him, apart from him. And that caused a lot of turmoil in somebody who believes that she now is going to hell. Right. So I'm somebody that's going to hell that loves God so much. It's but amazing that you you could feel that that sense of God's love yes. you know and at the mm -hmm. same time be struggling with all of this the earthly side of things you know just that complete turmoil yes. you know inside of you and so I I'm just I'm so thankful that you came and you were able to just tell us your story yes and I look so forward to continuing part two on the next episode part, part two, two has uh oh there's some adventures and not always rosy in my two decades i have made my fair share of mistakes and i own them because i am forgiven amen, amen. thank you jesus and um the second part is really good awesome well i'm sarah seberg thank you so much for joining us for this episode of kingdom real yes it's as real as it gets here and just thank you so much to Heidi for sharing your story. And we can't wait till next time. Please join us for part two coming up.